If you're looking for Christmas cheer, this is the place to find it. There are 105 Christmas trees throughout this house, and the woman who lives here says it's all worth it for the look on people's faces. Snowmen and pirates, princesses and Santa Claus, 12 foot trees and ones you can hold in your hand. Irene Smith has it all. My favorite time of year, uh, the always ban. 25 years ago, the Smiths started their tradition of adding more than just one Christmas tree to their home. It just started building and building. One tree turned to two and two eventually turned into 105. We have some that are ceramic, and some that are plush, some that are pictures. Each tree has its own theme. We have the White House tree, we have a snowflake tree, we have a pirate tree, then the snowman, our Disney tree, a Disney princess tree. Well, on this tree, my favorite ornament is the little bell shoe. The decorating starts the day after Thanksgiving and takes about a week. We have an assembly line. So they put them together, check the lights, move it to the next station. They fluff the tree up, they move it to the next station, and I bring it in and put it in its spot. To Irene's grandchildren, this is exactly how every home should look during Christmas. Again, we got this fun Disneyland. They love it. They're, they're, they help decorate, too. Mm -hmm. They do, like, cluster decorating where it's all the ornaments are in one area. But it's not just about the Christmas trees. They also have a growing village. We even name everybody, so all our family members are in there, all our friends are in there, so everybody has a place in the village. So now we'll have to have a camera crew. Unfortunately, it can't be Christmas all year round, so this will all be coming back down the first week of January. For now, reporting in Chandler, I'm Kim Powell for Arizona's Family. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to have been gathered here today in the Arizona State Capitol to honor the life and memory of thy servant, John Sidney McCain. We are grateful for his life and for his sacrifice. Gathered in this spot, we are especially grateful that John made Arizona his home. More than seven million of thy children have done likewise, and all of them, all of us, are grateful for John's able representation over these many years. We ask for thy spirit to abide with us as we mourn his passing. We ask for an added measure of thy spirit to be with John's sweet family, who have sacrificed so much for so long in sharing their loving husband and father with us for these many years. Send the comforter that they might be reminded that joy cometh in the morning. Now as we go forward, let us remember thy humble servant with gladness and cheerfulness to answer his call, to summon the better angels of our nature, to see and appreciate the humanity in our opponents, to more freely forgive so that we might be forgiven. Of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary Ruderstaller says she passes John and his dog Samson every day on the way to work. I asked him if his dog was okay, did he have enough food and water? And I also asked, was he okay? And he said yes to both. They struck up a friendship, and now Mary brings John and Samson lunch. And let me tell you, he loves his lunch. Like, I, I have such, so much pride into making his lunch. And he loves everything I put in it. But she noticed his belongings were a little worse for wear. It was falling apart. So um, I started posting pictures on Facebook because I have a lot of animal friends and they started following my story. She started a fundraising page online and her friends came through. It's amazing how everybody has come together. Until it was all taken away. We end up getting him that same cart right there and we got him a bunch of other stuff and that's when everything was stolen. So they started fundraising again. Now every time I post pictures of those two, they're always making comments and they just, they just love these two. Mary presented John with a new bike and pet trailer and John spent the day getting it all ready. And the new goodies have an alarm. If anybody even touches the handlebars, the alarm goes off and it's really loud. Mary says John is trying to get a job and get housing. Get in. 
Why are you going in the back way, huh? But until then, she'll be here. He has very little, and I have a lot of animal friends, and if we can all come together and um, give him the necessities and make his life a little bit easier, why not? Immediately after polls closed Tuesday night, a clear winner emerged in most races. But one is still very close, the Republican race for state superintendent. Candidate Frank Riggs is just a nose ahead of his opponent, Bob Branch, their lead against incumbent Diane Douglas widening. But things could still change. Maricopa County has several thousand more ballots to count, many of them last-minute early ballots. These are people that dropped off their ballot at, on Election Day. All of those ballots still have to be gone through. Their, their signatures have to be verified by hand uh, or by, by, uh, by person, and then they will be tabulated. Garrett Archer, senior elections analyst for the Arizona Secretary of State's office, says the process of counting these typically takes two or three days after the election. The Maricopa County Recorder's Office confirms it should be done counting for the most part by Friday. They were a little slow last night, but, but they've since sort of caught up to where we would expect them to be at this time. And as more people are now opting to vote early, could this mean even longer wait times for election results? Archer doesn't think so. I know that the counties are working on as, you know, as streamlining and making that process as efficient as possible so that as the volume increases, their ability to process these ballots faster also increases. Pouring rain, wild winds, flooded roads, and down power lines. There's no shortage of pandemonium during the monsoon, but when the chaos strikes, a well choreographed team jumps into action. Okay, all right, we do have some help on the way. Just it's that kind of calming voice inside the Phoenix Fire Dispatch Center that keeps us all safe during the monsoon madness. Not only do the folks in this alarm room take the 911 calls, figure out what that emergency is, send the actual apparatus, but they also communicate with the firefighters out in the field. But Phoenix Fire Captain Rob McCade says for his team to do their job, Valley residents also need to do theirs. First of all, make sure you do all you can to stay safe when the storms hit. Do not go into flooded washers, no matter how high your truck or car is. You're gonna get stuck and we're gonna have to rescue you. So stay out of them, stay off the roads. Also, make sure you evaluate whether you have a true emergency before dialing 911. If a tree does fall in your yard and nobody's injured and there's no power lines that are down, that's not a 911 call. If you go outside and the storm hits and your traffic lights on your street are out, that's not a 911 call. And while water flooding into your home can seem like an emergency, again, evaluate the true danger. But if there's actual water that's coming into your home, two, three inches, there's really nothing the fire department's gonna do for you with that. What we're worried about is if it's gonna cause an electrical problem or a shock for somebody in there, or if you do believe somebody that might be trapped in their home and can't get out. You can also call APS or SRP about down power lines, again, alleviating the stress in the 911 call center, so we can all help each other make it safely through another season of storms. Make sure that our folks can answer real emergency calls, and we get the red trucks out on the roads to take care of those folks that need that real emergency service.